I want to preach tonight from the topic, the glorious sons of God. The glorious sons of God. There are many royal or powerful families. Think about the royal family in London, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Bushes, the Kardashians, the Kings, the Jacksons, the Waltons are all powerful families with powerful family names. And to be born into such families is to be born into wealth, power, prestige, and privilege. I was reading an article not long ago by the Federalist. It was an article written by James Sabe. The title of the article simply says, privilege is just another word for family. And we need more of it. In the article, he states that family starts with privilege. A family starts when a man and a woman get married. I said they get married. And they choose each other above anyone else. And they give each other exclusive access and exclusive rights. That is the beginning of a family. And then they have children, and the privilege continues because the parents then try to give their children the best life possible. They provide them with safe homes and uh, access to privilege, and to, uh, they give them an education, and they teach them social graces. They give them access to their social connections. They teach them culture. They give their children the best privilege that they can. And if handled right, the privilege moves from generation to generation. And the family becomes thick in privilege. Because in family, we don't put up with each other and feed each other necessarily because we like each other. But we do it because we're family. And so that is where the privilege comes from. And as I read this article talking about family, I could not help but think about my own family. How grateful I am for where I've come from, for what I have been taught. And I thought about my family, that I am now the matriarch for three children, my husband and I. And surely we have tried to give them the best life that we could. I think about my church family, that we together are a family. But it really blew me away when I thought about privilege and considered the fact that through Jesus Christ, we are members of the family of God. We are members of his family. And God is so good because it would have been enough for God to have simply saved us. It would have been enough for God to uh, redeem us from the power and penalty of sin. For him to wash us and justify us and sanctify us, which is what most of the book of Romans is about. It would have been enough considering the fact that as human beings who are unsaved, our options were sin, death, hell, and the grave. It would have been enough for me had God saved me and made me his servant. It would have been enough for me if I could have been a slave of God. But the fact that he took it further and brought me into his family makes me proclaim what a mighty God we serve. And our text tonight, verse uh, verse. 14 verse 15 lets us know that when God saved us, he did not save us with a spirit of bondage that we should fear, but we have received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, in Western culture today, oftentimes we look at an adopted child or an adopted son as a second-class citizen. But in Roman culture, an adopted child was a child that came with prestige because they did not just adopt because they could not. 
have children or they did not adopt uh, only because they were trying to extend a helping hand. But if a father was unpleased with his son, he would simply adopt another son. And his adopted son had the privilege of possibly carrying the family name and getting the healthy portion of the family inheritance because he was chosen. And it's wonderful to know that we were not necessarily born into the family of God. Oh, we're not divine. We're not deity. But we are in the family of God because God specifically chose us. And as his adopted sons and daughters, we have rights and privileges. For the Bible said in Luke 13 and 16 about the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus said this daughter of Abraham should be healed. Because we are in the family of God, we have access to the throne of God to find grace and help in the time of need. Because we are in the family of God, we have the favor of God and we can have favor not only with God but with man because God can pull his strings and pull his connections and give access and favor to us. We are anointed by God. We are a part of the Abrahamic covenant because we're in his family. And that means that we are blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when we go out and blessed when we come in because we are in his family. And verse 17 takes it further and lets us know that not only are we just children in the family, but we are heirs of God. And joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It is amazing to me that we are able to participate in the inheritance of the glory of God. What have we done to deserve Christ's glory? Christ had to die for his glory. Christ had to take on human flesh for his glory. He had to live a sinless life for his glory. He was hung on a cross and mocked and scorned for his glory. He died and by the power of God rose again in three days for his glory. But just because we believe on him, God has provided that we take place and take part in the glory of God somebody ought to tell God thank you and as we participate in his glory we also participate in the sufferings in fact we are promised to partake in the glory if we partake in the suffering which is a good deal for me because we know that the word of God says that a man's days are full of trouble. You're going to suffer whether you're saved or not. You're going to struggle whether you struggle for Christ or not. But the struggle that is outside of Christ does not necessarily have eternal glory. But to know that we can suffer for Christ and participate in eternal glory, my God, that's good news to me and so when we look at the possible suffering that we will face here in this world Paul was very wise when he said that I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed there is no comparison to the struggles that we have here on earth to the glory that we'll have in heaven. The reason why is because our, our suffering many times comes from human beings, but our glory comes from God. Our suffering is in this human corruptible body, but our glory will be in an eternal incorruptible body body the glory that is coming for us is bigger than anything that we can deal with in this life so i take it as a badge of honor when we are persecuted for christ's sake when they call us homophobic when they tell us at the clinics to go home when we witness and they don't want to hear what we're talking about when we struggle in our flesh i want you to know that it is worth it because there is glory after
to this. And the glory is indescribable. There's not much that anybody can say about it because the word gives us to know that eye has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the glory that God has in store. But Paul does give us a glimpse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. He said, and behold, I shall show you a mystery that we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead that shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal putting on immortality. You all act like you're not excited about the future that God has for us. And so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55 says, oh death, where is your soul? Uh, we've had a lot of enemies, but I look forward to looking at death. Death that took Scott Hunter. Death that took Pop Wofford. Death that took Superintendent James Henry Turner and saying, oh, death, where is your sting? And oh, grave, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through Christ Jesus. And then Paul closed the, the, the chapter saying one more thing. Let therefore my beloved be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain people of God I'm here to let you know that your labor is not in vain and to know that our labor is not in vain we must look beyond the temporary we must look beyond the temporal and know that no matter what it looks like on this side there is victory there is glory for the believers in Jesus Christ that's why I agree with my bishop we ought to be the most excited we ought to be the most joyful people on earth because one glad morning when this life is over we shall be with Jesus and we're going to see him as he is we won't dwell with him in a body that aches but in an eternal body that hurts no more I hear Bishop Blake saying I see you in the future and you look much better than you look right now because right now you're in a temporal body that's subject to diabetes and cancer and high blood pressure but one of these old days you're gonna have a body that is incorruptible is there anybody excited about the future we have in God come on just take a minute and give God glory hallelujah and so with that thought in mind, knowing that we are a part of such a powerful family that has so many benefits, the thing that we have to know is that we have to be able to identify each other. We have to know who the sons of God are. We all know that when we have a family reunion, when we have a cookout, there's always somebody coming that nobody knows who claims to be a part of the family. But we see in the word of God that God has given us a way for us to know who the sons of God are. Verse 14 tells us that those for as many who are led of God <laughs> are the sons of God. Who are those who are the sons of God? They are those who are led of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so Paul is showing us that those who are in Christ Jesus, that we know who the sons of God and the people of God are, because those are the people who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We have to know here that Paul is not giving a directive. He's not saying that the sons of God and those who are in Christ Jesus should walk after the flesh. But rather he is describing the behavior of those who are really saved. He is saying that those who are in Christ Jesus walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. He is telling us a statement that applies to all true believers. If we look at verse 9, we see that God has given his spirit to everybody that belongs to him. Verse 9 of chapter 8 says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So when we have his spirit, when we truly are like him, when, you know, when you're really your sons and daughters, you don't have to try to look like your mama. You look like your mama. You don't have to try to be like your daddy. You, you're, you're like your daddy. And the sons of God, the people of God, have God's spirit and they walk according to his will. So when we put this whole thing together, we learn that the sons of God are people who walk according to the spirit and not after the flesh. And what does it mean to walk after the flesh? Walking after the flesh is when we walk according to our own sinfulness. When we walk according uh, to our own fallen nature, it is when we are carnal. And the people of God, the sons of God, are not carnal. For the Bible says uh, in, verse, in verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is peace and life because the carnal mind is enmity it is a variance it is hatred toward God for it is not subject to the law of God neither can be so as we know who we are we are the sons of God and that we walk according to the spirit then what we know is that those who will inherit the glory of God are those who are not carnal and this is a very scary thing because when you look in the body of Christ, there is an awesome spirit of carnality in the church right now. We have become so carnal. In fact, carnality has become the brand of the 21st century church. We have in that we are irreverent of God and we are uh, attractive to when you are trying to uh, be attractive and accommodating to the flesh to humanness and when we put our humanity above the deity of God that is carnality and when you look at the church and you see how we are. We see that we cannot hold you in church over 60 minutes because we don't want the flesh to be uncomfortable. That is carnality. When we see that we have tried to make the gospel marketable as opposed to being meaningful, that is carnality. Uh, look at even the design of the church, uh, how we've taken the crosses down. Bishop talks about this. We're sitting in the dark, and there are people who have their own debates about this, but the truth be told, we didn't get that from God. We got that from the world. 
we got that from the idea of taking the church and making it look like a place that people want to come to on the weekend which is the club and that is why it is carnal look at the doctrines of our day my god we have doctrines where people like bishop pearson proclaim that there is no hell uh, that i don't see how a loving god can send someone to hell that is so carnal because what god does and does not do is not subject to what i can see it's not subject to what i think he should do but god is god all by himself the carnality in the church is such that there is so much scandal so many isms and schisms that people have made a full-time job of following what's going on in the church we have become so carnal that our best of preachers they are men and women of God when they're preaching they're men and women of God when they're raising the offering they are deified and they hear from God when they're ministering but when it is time for them to possess their vessel and sanctification and honor they're just mere men that's carnality look at how we have the rise of gay quote unquote affirming churches I didn't say gay affirming clubs or gay affirming colleges I said gay affirming churches Churches that are allowing homosexuals and lesbians and transgenders to believe that you can be saved and be a homosexual or be in sexual perversion at the same time. That is the height of carnality. Because carnality is also the mindset when we have to remove, remake, and replace God so that God can justify what we are doing. And when I can see that the Bible says that a homosexual, that sexual immorality is against God, but I can still have a church that is quote unquote gay affirming, then I am carnal. I have replaced the standard of God with my own ideas. Oh, y'all should have got with me when I tried to preach about heaven. But carnality has crept into the church so much so that if you preach against the sin of sexual perversion, you're bashing. You're bashing. I can preach against the fornicator and I'm preaching. I can preach against the adulterer and I'm preaching. I can preach against the thief and I'm preaching. But if I take two seconds out of a 50 minute message and preach against homosexuality, I'm bashing. And the sad part is that the church and its leaders have co-signed to this carnal mentality. Even when you think about the convocation that we just came out of. If you've been to the convocation, you know we have church in the early morning. We have church in the mid-morning. We have church at noon. We have church in the afternoon. We have church in the evening. We have church at night. We have church at 10 o'clock and we have church at 12 o'clock and for and we do that for six or seven days and what have you heard about after the convocation of six or seven days of six or seven services per day a cumulative total of about 10 minutes was dedicated toward preaching against the sin of perversion and that is all we've heard about and we have heard preachers who are saying that we can't preach against that. We can't single them out. It's not that we preach it, but it's how we say it. Well, how are we supposed to preach it? So many times people say it's not what you're saying, but how you say it. Well, I say, all right, brother, sister, preacher, then show me how to say it. But the problem is when I watch them to see how they say it, they don't say anything. And if there is anything that we have learned.
learned from the messages that we've heard is that what the enemy wants is silence. And we, the people of God, can no longer be silent. The spirit of carnality grows in the church, not when we give our official signature and sign on to sin, not necessarily when we say, hey, come on in and do what you want to do. But sin grows and carnality grows when we say and do nothing. Ah. Uh, but God is not calling us to do that. It is the church's place to snatch us out of carnality and to show us what holiness looks like. That is why when we come here, we dress a certain kind of way. I don't believe in legalism. I don't believe that if I don't wear red lipstick that I got to make you not wear red lipstick. I don't believe that if I don't wear pantyhose that I have to tell you not to wear pantyhose. But I also do not believe in idolatry and we live in a time where we have made an idol out of clothes what do you mean that means that if I can't lead praise and worship in my ripped jeans then I can't come to your church if that is your standard then you are carnal because you have made a God out of your ripped jeans if you say that I can't come to your church because you're gonna make me take out my earring then you are carnal because you have made a God out of your earring if you say that I can't come to your church because I want to wear my short skirt then you are carnal because you have made a God out of your shirt y'all not getting with me if you say that I can't come to your church because I want to show my tattoos and you leave the church because you want to show your tattoos then you are carnal because you have made a God out of tattoos and we cannot leave the extent of legalism and become idolaters. Shame on me if I find a Bible-believing church. And I don't want to go to that church based on my outfit. Shame on me if I find a church where the word of God is going forth. Demons are cast out. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. Signs and wonders are following them. We're feeding the sick and raising the dead. And I don't want to come because y'all are in past 60 minutes. Shame on me. And it's so important that we, the family, the upper room family, that we understand who we are, that we understand carnality so that we can guard ourselves against it. Think it not strange that we live in a day where the transsexual walks in churches and dares you to say something to them. Think it not strange that preachers are having to take stands on things. And I let you know tonight that we will see this come even more so in our own churches. And the enemy already knows what Bishop Wooden thinks. The enemy already knows what first assistant thinks. But what the enemy wants to know is what do you think? If they come and sit by you, what are you going to say? When they put you in the corner at the barber shop, what you going to say? When they talk about it at the hair salon, what are you going to say? We have to be unified and on one accord that this is the house of God. And it is the house of prayer. And that it is a sacred place that we shall not be carnal. Somebody give God glory. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. And so we fight carnality. We fight this idea that I've tried to be saved and I've prayed, but it just isn't working for me. Oh, the devil is a liar. We fight this idea of cheap grace. That grace means that I can live however I want. That grace means that I get saved and I name the name of Christ, but I go on and I do what I want to do. No, 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 no. It is up to us as the sons of God to make known in the world that you can be saved. That there is a reality to holy living. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, let's read just a few scriptures. I've gotten ahead of myself, praise God. But let's just read a few scriptures. Romans chapter 13 and verse 
13 says, let me give you a minute. Praise the Lord. Romans 13 and 13 says, let us walk honestly as in the day. Mm. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Ah, someone told me, when you're losing weight, you should throw out your bigger clothes. Because if you throw out your bigger clothes, you get rid of the possibility of gaining the weight back. That is the idea of making no provision for the flesh. There is no need in saving some numbers. You're making no provision for the flesh. There are some things you used to wear. You can go on and throw it away. You're making no provision for the flesh. There's no need in you keeping that one bottle of alcohol in your house. Throw it away. Make no provision for the flesh. Uh, you don't mind if the Bible does the talking tonight. Let us go over to Titus chapter 2. Hallelujah. Titus, glory to God. Chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What does grace teach us? It teaches us that you can do whatever you want to do and God understands. No, verse 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what I like, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous to good works the way that we know that God is serious about us living out his righteousness is the way that he purchased it he did not purchase it with silver and gold but the Bible gives us to know that he gave himself oh and with God giving us himself I don't know about you but I just feel inclined that I owe God myself I owe God to present my body a living sacrifice holy and acceptable I just feel like that's my reasonable service hallelujah let's go one more to Ephesians chapter 5 I'm almost finished. Ephesians chapter 5. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And listen, he said, and walk in love. Because they throw that at us a lot. You Christians need to walk in love. So that's what Paul told Ephesus. You all walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. For a sweet smelling Savior. But, uh, he said, walk in love, but fornication and uncleanness and covetousness. Let it not be named among you, once among you, as becoming saints. Oh, my God. Verse 4 says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which is not convenient, but rather giving thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. 
And he goes on to say, let no man deceive you with vain words. Because of these things, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore take partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Listen, proving what is acceptable unto God. That is our mission, to not let, uh, oh my God, fornication, uh, covetousness, to not let those things be named among us, which means that as a family, we have to hold each other accountable. Which means as a family, we have to be uh, uh, accountable to each other. Which means we have to be confidential for each other. It's a shame that oftentimes we don't know that the pastors are hurting until they commit suicide. And it's on the internet. We don't know that the people are struggling until it has come out. Because so many times we, the body of Christ, do not have the environment where we can cover each other and help each other and confide in one another. But as the sons of God, because we're both in the same family, but my brother Patrick, if he has a need, he can tell me. He doesn't have to be ashamed. And if I have a need, I can tell him. And as the family of God, we ought to be able to confide in one another. That's the only way that we can keep it from being named among us. And that we have to walk away from such foolishness. Oh my God today. And the last scripture tonight is coming from Hebrews. I'm running out of time. Oh my goodness. I thought Bishop was just saying that. But time does go pretty quickly. Hebrews chapter 12. Glory to God. Good Bible study. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Listen to this. It says, wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And he says, and follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. And listen to this, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, thereby many are defiled. Many are bitter. We cannot allow conflict to go on among us. That the root of bitterness comes along and many are defiled. And verse 16 says, lest there be any fornicator or, for, or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat soul, sold his birthright. We know that as the sons of God, we have an inheritance. But we are to not to be like Esau, who sold his inheritance for a morsel of meat. Verse 17 says something very special. It says, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully. And in the family of God, sons and daughters of God, we must avoid the Esau syndrome. The Esau syndrome causes us to throw away our inheritance, to throw away 
our relationship with God for temporary satisfaction. Uh, God rejected Esau, but he rejected him and he resented him. He resented him because of the way that he treated what he gave him. And if you know the story of Esau, you know that Esau went back to his father and he asked his father to pray for him that he would receive another blessing. And his father prayed, but no blessing came. And no blessing came because he had the heart for his father, but he didn't have a heart for God. And as the sons of God, we must be very careful that in our sonship, that we are not more connected to man than we are to God. We must be careful that we are not our pleasers. God is saying that I am looking for sons who will live holy because I'm watching, not because of anybody else. Uh, it is time out for us having holiness based on who sees us. It's time out for our holiness to be based on who we're told on. It's time out for us crying like Esau because we got caught. Uh, but we have to cry because we know that we want to please God. I can tell you that I, had all, I have an awesome family, an awesome father. But what kept me was not so much the fear of my father. But what it was, it was the fear of God. Because you can fool man. You can fool the wisest of people. Oh, but you can't fool God. And if you throw away what God has given you, ah, oh, when God rejects you, there is no man who can restore you. So it's time out for us being I pleasers. It's time us out for us being men pleasers. And we have to make up our minds that as the sons of God, I will please God. Come on, standing all over the sanctuary. Hallelujah, playing softly in the background. I ask God, come on, play holy, holy, holy. Thank you, Jesus. I ask God, that God, why have you given us this kind of message tonight. Certainly, in my opinion, we are not a carnal church. I'm not the pastor. I would not be in the place of authority to say that anyway. But I ask God, God, why have you given us this message for tonight? And I heard God say, as audibly as I hear my own voice, what God told the people in Joshua chapter 5, verse 3, he said, sanctify yourselves. Because tomorrow, uh, I will do wonders in your midst. There is another level of glory that God has designated and prepared for this house. You'd have to be living under a rock, not to be able to see with your spiritual eye that there is a shift in the atmosphere. And that there is another level of glory that is not only coming to this house, but Bishop also often says what is happening to him is not just happening to him, but to us. And family of God, I'm here to tell you, that God is saying, sanctify yourselves. For there is another release of glory. That when you clean the clutter of carnality. When you clean the clutter of sinfulness. When you lay aside the weights and the sins that easily beset you. Look and see if my glory will not be there. The people in Joshua were preparing to cross over Jordan. And that crossing Jordan was the last step before they went into Canaan. And God did a miracle because he allowed them to walk over. But he told the people of God, he said, I'm going to do a miracle, but you have to carry the glory with you. 
You have to get the ark of the glory, the ark of the covenant, and carry it with you. And I want you to know that as we stand on the edge of another year, hear me when I say that the glory of God shall be revealed in us. Because that's what the Bible says in Romans. It says uh, that it that the glory will be the that the sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That is, the glory shall not be revealed on us, but in us, and that the glory is already in us because we are the sons. Of God already so the glory rests among us and in us already but one day the glory that's in us shall be revealed uh, I was pregnant with John by March of 2000 I believe 17 16 but what was in me was revealed on December 27th and God is declaring in this house that there is a glory that shall be revealed, but not for the carnal, not for the wicked, not for the double-minded, not for those who are not sure where they stand in God, but there is a glory for those who are resolute and sure that I am a child of God. Come on, if that's you tonight, just lift your hands for just one minute and give God glory. Give God glory and recommit your way unto him. Recommit yourself to not be carnal. Recommit yourself to his holiness. Recommit yourself to be holy as he is holy. He has called us to be holy. And now God in Jesus name we come before you even now. God, we stand before you as the sons of God. God, we stand before you dedicated to being, oh God, the revelation of your glory. God, we give up those things that block your glory in our lives. God, we give up every sin. We give up every bad habit. God, we give up every relationship that keeps us from being who you'd have us to be. Oh God, and we give ourselves to you. God, we give ourselves to you, asking you to have your way in our lives. We ask you, oh God, to fill us again with your spirit. We ask you, oh God, to endow us with the power of God. We ask you, oh Oh God, uh, to free us from carnality. Uh, God, we don't want to be gossipers. God, we don't want to be backbiters. Uh, God, we don't want to be divided. Uh, God, we don't want to be sexually immoral. Uh, but God, we want to be holy. Um, come on, somebody say, God, I want to be holy. Come on, God, we want to be holy. We want your holiness. For we want to see you as you are. And God, we give you glory. We give you praise. And we thank you in advance for the glory that shall be revealed. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the awesome work of Jesus. We thank you for the good things that you have in store for us. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come on, somebody in here. Lift your hands and lift your voice and worship the God of the Bible. Worship the holy God of Israel. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voice and give him the praises. Give him the fruit of your redeemed lips. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Praise him in the beauty of holiness. Come on, praise him in the beauty of holiness to worship some gods you have to be sexually immoral but all God asks us to do is to lift our hands and to lift our voices hallelujah and give him glory thank you Jesus we are the glorious sons of God